this key. All right, so welcome back to The Young Idealist in my ongoing series on classical German philosophy and post-Kantian thought. And this episode, I have a very, very special guest who is going to take us back in time. And because I'm not an expert in this field, I've invited uh, Dr. Peter Adamson, who you all know from his wonderful podcast, A History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. So um, thank you for coming here, Peter, and welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Chris. I'm happy to do it. So Dr. Peter Adamson is a professor and chair of late antiquity and Arabic philosophy in the Faculty of Philosophy and Philosophy of Science and Religious Studies at the Ludwig Maximilian Universität de Munich as well as a professor of philosophy at King's College London. Dr. Adamson is also, as I stated, the brilliant, um, has a brilliant podcast entitled A History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. And the series is also in book form through Oxford University Press. I have my copy here. <laughs> These are very, very accessible for both students and scholars. They're affordable and they're exciting to read. Um, he's also the author of Don't Think for Yourself, Authority and Belief in Medieval Philosophy through the University of Notre Dame, which came out in 2022. Um, sorry, yeah, 2022, as well as Ibn Sina, A Very Short Intro through Oxford University and Philosophy in the Islamic World, A Very Short Introduction. He's also the editor of Inter Interpreting um, Averroes, Critical Essays, Interpreting Avicenna, Critical Essays, as well as the Cambridge Companion to Arabic Philosophy with Richard C. Taylor. And there are many more books as well, too. So okay. I'm, I'm happy that you're here and taking us back in time to this wonderful and rich era of, of German, German medieval philosophy. So where do you think that we should start in order to get the viewer caught up to this period? Well, there's a lot of places we could start, but maybe, especially for the context of your series, it would be best to think about the place of Germany in medieval philosophy as a whole. And you could even maybe go backwards. So you could start with uh, thinking about the fact that Kant and other German idealists are working within a Protestant culture, right? So then you could move back to Luther, and then you could move back to what's happening in the run-up to Luther. And that would mean thinking about, roughly speaking, what's happening in the Northern Renaissance in the 15th and early 16th centuries. So that would be like Erasmus, but of course he's not German, he's from the Low Countries. We could, however, think about Nicholas of Cusa, who is a German philosopher, spent time in Italy, but was German, um, hence his name. And he is a Renaissance philosopher in the 15th century who maybe shows you what at least a certain kind of philosophy was like within a couple of generations of Luther. So that would sort of be moving backwards from the kind of thing you usually do to what we might think of as broadly medieval philosophy, because as we'll be seeing, Kuza can be located within a broadly medieval tradition of thought. So that that's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it would be to move from the beginning towards today. So go back to early medieval. And there, I think an interesting feature of German medieval philosophy is that it takes a while to catch up to what we usually think of as like the standard paradigm for medieval philosophy, which is basically a university setting with schoolmasters in, either in an arts faculty or, or in a theology faculty. So here we'd be thinking about someone like Aquinas or Scotus or Occam or Buridan, etc. And these figures are notable for A, not being German, and B, not having worked in Germany, right? So Scotus, Scotus and Occam are from Britain. Aquinas is from Italy. They work in the universities of Paris or Oxford. And there's a good reason why they're not working at universities in Germany, because there aren't any yet. So eventually, and certainly by the time we get to Luther, there are plenty of universities in Germany. So you've got universities at, you know, Heidelberg and Ingolstadt and Erfurt and so on. And also um, further east, like Prague. And actually, maybe th that maybe the very first thing I should have said before I even got into all these details is that it's actually not that clear what Germany 
means in the medieval period. So obviously the German nation state isn't even on the distant horizon yet. And basically what you've got is lots of smaller principalities or political units that are broadly under the Holy Roman Empire, right? But when I say Germany, I just mean like what today would be Germany or the regions that would be um, occupied by the philosophers you usually cover, like German idealists, okay? So, sorry, <laughs> with that caveat aside, in that area, universities are a relatively late arrival. So they start being founded mostly in the 14th century and then 15th century. And that's broadly true of Europe as a whole. So you have some very early foundings already in the uh, 12th century, like Bologna, for example. But then the main philosophical centers, Paris, Oxford, they are founded in around the sort of early 13th century, right? And so that's why you have a setting for doing very advanced philosophical work, often in the context of theology, by someone like Aquinas, who's in Paris, right? And so that actually might make you think, well, Germany then is kind of a backwater philosophically in this period, that maybe there isn't even that much to say about it, right? Because all the action is somewhere else. It's either in Britain or in France or even down in Italy. But that's actually not true. And there's a couple of reasons that's not true. One is that actually it's just generally not true that philosophy only happens at universities in the medieval period. And you can already see that from what I just said, which is that the main universities don't get founded until the turn of the 13th century. Obviously, there's philosophy going on in like the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, right? And so you have to ask yourself, well, what would have been the context of that kind of philosophy? And the answer is not a university, but either a school attached to a religious institution, like a cathedral. So someone like Peter Abelard in France would have been teaching in that kind of context. Or, and this is going to be more important for us, something like a monastic setting. So a place where um, monks or nuns are living, so either a monastery or a convent. This is where a lot of philosophy gets done in the early Middle Ages. And that would certainly be a context in which there can be philosophy in early medieval German um, context, right? Um, so that's one point to make, is that you don't have to be at a university to do philosophy in the Middle Ages. So the absence of universities in Germany until the 14th century isn't kind of lethal for the project of thinking about medieval German philosophy. The other thing to bear in mind is that we tend to think of medieval philosophy as this very kind of elite, erudite, Latin phenomenon. So maybe not erudite, because that sounds more like the humanists, but like technical. So technical Latin, it's uh, almost written in code in a way that only other schoolmen would be able to appreciate. And of course, they would be men because the universities were not open to women. But there's a lot of medieval philosophy in vernacular languages, right? And one of the things that I think we'll see in this conversation as we talk about some of the highlights of German medieval philosophy is that quite a lot of it is written in German, not in Latin. And that's even going to be true of someone like Eckhart, for example, who also writes in Latin. It's a, it's a kind of German that you and I would find hard to read <laughs> because it's sort of like trying to read Chaucer in English, right? It's like weird and it's weird German from our point of view but you can so sort of see what it means. And if you look at a translation into modern German, you can be like, oh yeah, okay, I can see how that works. Just like you can see a translation of Chaucer into English, right? Um, and so these are the two things I would wanna bear in mind just in thinking about Germany as a kind of geographical space for philosophy is that it doesn't need to be a university setting. It could be a monastic setting. Or it could even be like a, a royal court or something like that. But I think that what, what would be more important for us is the monastic setting and that it doesn't need to be in Latin. It could be in vernacular. Well, I think you, you really did a great job of setting the stage for us. And now we know that German philosophy or German medieval philosophy is not just in the situation of, of the schoolmen or of a, a university. So where is this philosophy happening? Well, it depends on which figures we're going to talk about. So if you're thinking about someone like Hildegard of Bingen, for example, she's a nun, 
so she's at a, a convent near Mainz and she lived there for decades. That's where she do, writes her works. And that is a interesting setting for philosophy and interesting setting also for women doing philosophy, or maybe we could bracket the question of whether it's philosophy, but doing some kind of intellectual work, right? Because first of all, um, a monastic setting is one in which you might be able to acquire literacy, which obviously is a precondition for writing books. You might or might not acquire literacy in Latin, right? Um, and there's often an interesting question when we're looking at female medieval thinkers in general, whether they know Latin, whether they're having a man help them read and write Latin, or whether they don't need that. So, and there's kind of a variety there. Um, so, so for one thing, you've got a kind of context in which learning can happen, and also a context in which writing can happen, which is maybe... Uh, um, something we tend to think of as a kind of freestanding activity, but actually should probably be understood as some kind of manifestation of a practically engaged life where they obviously be leading lives of very devout prayer, community. Um, sometimes these kind of works are written for the fellow sisters or brothers in the order. So a good example of that, although not an example from Germany, would be Anselm. So his famous ontological argument is written in a work that's actually dedicated to and aimed at his fellow monks, right? So he, again, would be a, a figure who's working in a monastic setting, not in a university, because he's too early for that. Um, so I think that's probably the most interesting place to start. There is also the phenomenon of female writers who aren't nuns but have somehow devoted themselves to a spiritual life, right? So these people are often called Begins. And someone else we're going to talk about, Mechtel of Magdeburg, would be a Begin, right? Um, so that that's another uh, sort of quasi-monastic cultural phenomenon that I would kind of group together with the idea of people writing at convents and um, monasteries. It should be said that... Um, when when you talk about actually universities also so both universities and monasteries you could think oh well these are sort of um in a way democratic institutions because anyone can join right so our kind of our assumption that it's really only rich elite people who do philosophy which is generally speaking pretty true for the pre-modern era um i mean like there's a good reason that kant is not a peasant Right. I mean, so, you know, if peasants just aren't going to get educated to that degree that they'd be able to um, achieve such high degree of literacy and um, also at a young age be exposed to the kinds of ideas you would need in order to turn into Kant. Right. And you might be thinking, oh, well, in the medieval period, actually, it'd be a lot more open because anyone can kind of turn up to the university, anyone can join a monastery. That's kind of true. So it is true that a broader range of people would have been able to go to university then would have been able to, for example, receive royal patronage and become an intellectual at a court, right? Which is how a lot of intellectuals in the medieval period, also in other cultures, would be in business. But it's, I think, telling that someone like Hildegard actually does come from a fairly privileged background. So her family was well-to-do. So she was already kind of in the upper echelon before she joined the um, convent or before she uh, joined the order. And I think that's probably true for the majority of monastic figures who we actually see writing works that have come down to us today. Now I've heard Hildegard's music, which is, uh, yeah, right. Right. which is beautiful, but also mm -hmm. in an eerie sense, just the way that her tone goes up and down and, mm -hmm. and I understand I've actually never read any of her writings. So maybe we can talk about what she's known for in her writings. Are they are they more prayer or are they uh, kind of meditations? Kind of neither, actually. I think, though, that you're right to maybe highlight the fact that she also wrote music. She also staged plays in the convent. So, for example, she wrote a play in which the Sisters of the Order would all like be dressed as representations of the different virtues and they would all kind of recite lines that she had written for them. So she is a sort of 
multimedia, multidisciplinary figure. She also writes about gardening and, you know, herbs and plants or botany, I guess you could say. She writes about mineralogy. She has a theory about how gems form in the earth. So she's a very kind of um, multidimensional figure. The texts, though, that are more philosophical, I mean, I guess you could think about the stuff on plants and minerals as natural philosophy, actually. But if you're thinking about like metaphysics and philosophical theology, the place to find that is in works which actually have a very uh, unique format. So what she does is she reports on a vision that she's had. And the first thing that happens is you get this kind of poetic description of the vision without any explanation of what's going on. So like I saw this mountain and there was a huge demon on the mountain and there was fire raining down and there was a river and I'm kind of making this up, but it's sort of like that, right? So there's all these sort of obviously symbolic features and which, and she's saying that this is a divinely sent vision, right? So it's a mystical experience that she's had, which was sent to her by God. And that's important because she actually invoked this sort of hotline to God in her dealings with other people. So for example, at one point, the Bishop of Mainz was in a conflict with her and she wrote to him and basically said, I mean, obviously she didn't put it this way, but she basically said, look, don't mess with me. I speak for God, right? So she pulled rank on the bishop, right, as a local nun. And it's kind of amazing that she got away with this. I mean, given the gender dynamics at the time, the reason she did get away with it is that there were men who were willing to say, yes, she's a genuine visionary. So she's really having these mystical experiences, like Bernard of Clairvaux, who's another famous visionary, mystical, um, monastic writer of the 12th century. So that's the first thing you get in her works is a vision. And then the, to me, the most amazing thing is that instead of just saying, well, here's the vision I had, you make of it what you will, because I'm only a woman, how should I know, right? Which is something she could easily have done. Instead, you turn the page and she says, okay, now I will tell you what this means. And she goes through the vision and decodes every bit of it and she says you know the giant represents this and the fireballs represent this and she basically unfurls this whole philosophical um kind of interpretation which is usually either about the transcendence of god or the nature of sin or other ethical teachings so it's actually not that i was actually just rereading what i said about it in, in the book you were holding up before and i say in there and i think this is i probably stand by this right that it's not like full of really weird philosophical or theological claims so the weird thing is the way she presents it it's not the content as it were and i think the really revolutionary thing about it is that she is taking advantage of the claim that she's had these mystical experiences in order to effectively set herself up as an authoritative intellectual voice right so you should believe that she's the one who understands what her visions mean because she was sent the visions and she's sort of already also been sent by God the capability of understanding them, right? So she doesn't need to, for example, consult the church hierarchy to find out whether the visions are real, what they mean, how to interpret them, how they uh, somehow fit with received authoritative theological doctrine. None of that. It's just Hildegard, here's what I experienced, here's what it means. Um, and in that respect, it actually makes it int for an interesting contrast with some other medieval mystics. So, for example, Julian of Norwich, who's not German, but is, I think, a really interesting person to con contrast with Hildegard. She lives from the end of the 14th into the 15th century. And she had, in some ways, a very similar experience and in some ways a very different experience. Similar because she also had all of these visions and also because she was a kind of monastic figure. She was an anchorite. So she was like an even more ascetic version of a nun in a way. And she had these really, I think, terrifying visions while she was lying sick in bed, possibly about to die, where Christ appeared to her covered in blood, like hanging on a crucifix. And they were these really violent visions. And also Christ spoke to her 
and gave her these words of reassurance, right? So famously, he said to her that all will be well, right? And the difference, though, is that um, in Julian's writings, instead of saying, okay, here's what I experienced, here's what it means, like very, this very kind of confident voice you get in Hildegard, with Julian, she didn't know what it meant. And she went off and meditated for years about what she had seen, and then eventually kind of came back and said, here's what I think was going on. Right? So she had to figure it out. It was almost like a riddle that she had to decode. And although Hildegard's works also read like riddles that need to be decoded, she immediately has the key. Right? So she knows what's going on. And you might even, I think if you wanted to be a little bit cynical, you might even think that she's sort of created the vision as a kind of literary work in order to um, do her own symbolic representation of the things she wants to say philosophically and theologically. Now, in terms of the writing style, like if we if we moved from um, Hildegard to Mechtild, so the, mm -hmm. the begins, so yeah. not really, I mean, not really a nun, but still took vows of chastity and, and poverty. Exactly. What are the differences in writing between Mechtild and, and Bingen, do you think? Or we could just talk about Mechtild. Did. Yeah, I mean, one thing about Mechthild is that it's much more like a literary work and much less didactic. So first of all, you don't get the structure, vision, interpretation. You just get um, a kind of poetic meditation, right? And it's much more like a, like I say, a literary work that expresses her emotional and psychological state in regard to God. So she, along with Hadevich, who is not considered German because she's from the Low Countries. So I think she's from near Antwerp, um, but kind of German, right? And so obviously writing in a Germanic language, right? Um, I mean, writing in medieval Dutch instead of medieval German, but famously medieval Dutch is kind of German, right? <laughs> So we could sort of think of Hadewich, Hadewich as a relevant figure here too. And she's certainly comparable to Mechthild because she's also a Beguine. So both of them are interesting because they are taking the tropes and themes of medieval love poetry and love literature and applying that to the relationship between themselves or their souls and God. So the main theme in these works is that the soul has a kind of erotic longing for God. And God's transcendence here is not expressed in terms of these sort of terrifying visions that Hildegard have, or maybe not, uh, maybe terrifying would be better for Julian than Hildegard, but Hildegard's visions are awe-inspiring for sure. Um, whereas in the, the, so, the so-called mine, which means love, right? So this the so-called mini literature, the literature of kind of theological love, these begins represent God's transcendence as being like the absence of a lover, which of course is a trope from medieval courtly love poetry and so on. So like the knight who only catches a glimpse of the beloved from the tower or whatever and is like, sort of mooning around in the garden and hoping to catch another glimpse of the beloved or, you know, find a handkerchief she's dropped on the ground or something. And this is basically how these figures describe their relationship to God. So God is sort of absent from them. And then occasionally they have these moments of encounter with God, which are also described very erotically. Um, so there's even a passage in Mechthild where she talks about the soul being naked, waiting for God to come to the soul, right? So wait like waiting in bed for the lover to arrive and ravish you right and there's pretty hot stuff in Hadovich as well um so this is very daring i think um but on the other hand i think it would have also been read as clearly just an appropriation of material from a se broadly secular literary um kind of tradition and they're just kind of bringing this into the medieval mystical literary tradition, which is quite interesting. I sometimes think it's sort of like the reverse of what happened with gospel and soul music. So gospel music was this like extremely impassioned 
um, thing that you would do in church, right, in the United States. And then Sam Cooke and Ray Charles sort of doing it, but singing about women instead of God, <laughs> right? Um, so bringing it into a secular context. This is the other way around. So this is taking something that was secular, secular erotic longing, and putting it into a religious context. And how did the religious authorities take to this kind of this this these literary works being written in a kind of courtly love manner? Did, were they not happy with them? Were they skeptical? Were they kind of just okay? You do your thing. We'll do our own thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That it's amazing in if in a way that the, the works survive. Right. So you can see that you can see that they had a certain degree of acceptance from the mere fact that we can still read them. Right. And in fact, in the case of Mechthild, we don't even have the original. We have a translation from the 14th century in a more recent version of German. So it's basically, I mean, it's not really a translation. It's more like an updating of the work from 13th century to 14th century German, which makes it actually easier to read than it would have been otherwise. I mean, I still needed a modern German translation, but... It would, it's a lot easier than it would have been if it had been the original 13th century. Um, and that was done by a man, right? <laughs> so the, and I think also, like I mentioned with Hildegard, Hildegard explicitly consulted churchmen and got them to approve of what she was doing, right? So there is definitely a sense in which both tacitly and explicitly male church authorities are needed in order to allow these things to be written and then also in order to um for the text to be transmitted down through the tradition um it, there's a couple of interesting um cases we could compare here one would be marguerite Poret, who's a french uh thinker so a, a kind of noble woman of the early the late 13th early 14th century and she was actually put to death because her writings were considered to be heretical and amazingly, her work does survive, um, but I think it sort of just barely got through the net. Um, I don't remember exactly what the details of the manuscript tradition are, but we do have the work. And it was actually then translated into numerous languages and may have actually influenced Meister Eckhart, um, who's someone we, we might want to talk about as well. Um, but then you also see uh, uh, figures later on, like during the time of the Inquisition, actually having to write to the church and saying, okay, is it all right if I do this, right? Or even being told that they should write down what they've been experiencing as in terms of their mystical um, encounters with God so that the Inquisition can decide whether or not it's acceptable, right? Um, so, you know, you have, you have, I think, a very complicated situation here. I, I guess we tend to think that the medieval church was very effective in being able to crush dissent or anything that they considered to be even somewhat suspect but actually that's not true for one thing so you can see that from the case of marguerite right so here's someone who was actually burned to death in paris and yet her work survives right so that and all the same is true for the inquisition so um they made all kinds of efforts in the 16th century to stop things from circulating and it basically didn't work because it was too difficult right um, I mean, just practically speaking, not possible. So that's not to say the Inquisition had no effects, but it wasn't the kind of uh, pervasive thought control that people often think. So that's one thing. But I think then the other thing is that there's a lot of sympathy even within the church for these kind of mystical insights or characters. So Hildegard, as far as I can tell, was really celebrated by powerful people within the church pretty much from the get-go. And, uh, you know, there are illuminated manuscripts of works by Hildegard and so on. So she's very uh, sort of taken up by the institutions. I think there might be a way in which, and again, this might be a little bit cynical, but I think there might be a sense in which the church found it congenial to have some kind of outlet for female spirituality and not say that it could only be mediated through the conduit of male enablers. I think that might have been something that was sort of strategically welcome to them. Um, and so perhaps at some level, they were like, yeah, we're going to allow this to an extent, right? 
And it, as I say, maybe they couldn't have stopped it anyway if they'd wanted to. So you had brought up um, Marguerite Perret and the Beguines, and we had talked a little bit about Mechdid, and you had mentioned that uh, Perret, Mag Marguerite Perret had influenced the brilliant uh, master, Meister Eckhart. Mm. And I know Meister Eckhart because I'm a Schelling fanatic, and Schelling talks about Grund and Abgeschiedenheit and oh, nice. releasement and, and these things. So maybe we can now move to Meister Eckhart. So sure, who is yeah. Eckhart and what is his importance for this, this time period? Eckhart's part of a larger phenomenon, which is the success of the Dominican order in Germany. So now we're moving ahead to the 14th century. So or Eckhart's actually from the 13th to the 14th century. And then there are some other German Dominicans who are operating in the 14th century. Um, but actually, if you want to talk about German Dominicanism, we should at least pause to mention Albert the Great, Albertus Magnus, the teacher of Thomas Aquinas. So he is German, for starters. So he, he teaches at Paris as well. But um, Aquinas actually studied with Albert in Köln, I think, or Cologne for people who are speaking English. You, actually, you want to hear something embarrassing? Until I moved to Germany, I did not realize that Cologne and Köln were the same place. Like I knew there was a German city called Köln, but Cologne looks like it's French, right? So I was like, oh, Cologne, like that must be in France near the German border or something. And then when I got here, I was like, oh my gosh. Like, I did the same it. thing, by the way. I went to, oh, I, thank goodness. Yeah. I did a conference. Um, I have family that live in Bonn and mm -hmm. they took me to Cologne and I saw the old, you know, this. there's like rock, there's still, um, right by the big dome church, there's mm -hmm. actual rock from the, the Roman time, I think. Mm -hmm. And I have a picture there and I kept asking my, kept asking my cousin, when are we getting to Kern? She's like, Chris, you're in you're Kern. In Kern. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad I'm not the only one. In any case, so Albert was there, Aquinas was there with him, and actually um, Aquinas wrote up some of his lectures. Uh, so he was like the secretary. And Albert also later on traveled through Germany quite a bit. So this again takes us back to this issue that you don't have to be at a university in order to be doing intellectual work. So the mendicant orders, which are kind of a new phenomenon in the 13th century. So now we're thinking about the Franciscans, the Dominicans, right? And a lot of important philosophers in the medieval period are either Franciscans or Dominicans. So um, Albert and Aquinas and Meister Eckhart are Dominicans, Scotus and Occam are Franciscans, for example. Now, as I said, most of these famous scholastics were operating at universities, that includes Albert, but there are also various um, schools attached to the uh, communities of, of these mendicant orders. And so uh, Albert was able to like travel around from one Dominican center to the next and also did teaching there. And that's true also for some of these German, later German Dominicans who are working in the late 13th, early 14th century, mid 14th century. So um, getting back to Eckhart, so he's a Dominican, he writes in Latin, but he also writes in German, which is interesting. So you just mentioned this word Grund, which is, I didn't know that this was in Schelling as well. So I don't know anything about Schelling really. I know Schelling's a big Neoplatonist as well, but. Yes, that, so he, he has, conceptions of Grund, what he gets from Meister Eckhart, and Ungrund, which comes from Jakob Burma. So this, right. this kind of uh, theosophical, speculative pietist tradition. Right. Okay. Well, I will get to this in my podcast in due course. <laughs> it might take me a while. So, th so that's a really good example of a piece of like genuinely German philosophical terminology or theological terminology. It is not clear what Grund would be in Latin. Right. And the idea is so Grund means ground, roughly. And the idea is that God is the ground of everything and that everything is somehow rooted in or grounded in God to the point that the very being of things is completely dependent on God. So you could think about this as, um, you, I mean, you certainly think about it in terms of everything being an effect of God, which would be anything but an original idea, right? So everybody agrees that every, that all created things are the effect of God. But he has a more radical notion 
which is that the being of created things is somehow in God, right? So you might think that uh, a created thing like you or me is just a manifestation of the true being that is God, right? And that's the sense in which God is your ground. So there isn't another way of putting it might be that you don't have any reality beyond the reality of God. So you're, you're grounded in God in that sense. One image he uses here is that created things are mere signs of God. And he gives this nice example, which also shows up in some of the philosophy of language of the time, which is that um, you could have a like a picture of a vine, like a grape vines, and you could hang it on a building, and that would show you that you can buy wine in that building, right? Like a tavern, right? And so in this analogy, God is like the wine or the tavern, and we are like the sign. So we're just a kind of symbol of God's reality, right? Now that's a very traditional idea in a sense because it's something you get in other mystical traditions like even Sufism, Islamic mysticism. Um, you find similar ideas like uh, the mystic Ibn Arabi, who's a bit earlier. Uh, so I guess he's 12th century. He, um, or 11th century. He No, he's 12th century. Um, he would say that the names of God are somehow both um representations of god and identical with creation right so like god's power is just the manifestation of god in creation and eckhart seems to be saying something very similar to that something else though that he adds which again is something you could probably um compare to sufism is that he has a radical negative theology so he says um that God is nothing. So he uses the German word nicht, which is spelled in some weird medieval German way. So I think it's just N-I-H-T. But anyway, it's, it's nicht, nicht or nichts in modern German. And the idea here is that maybe at least from our point of view, what we think of as reality is this, right? So it's, you know, bodies, the difference between you, me, the walls, the books, whatever. That's what we think of as a reality. And because God is so transcendent, God is beyond reality as we know it. So there's this kind of paradoxical teaching, which is that on the one hand, anything that's truly reality in the created world is just God because it's all grounded in him. But on the other hand, God is unknowable to us and is beyond our normal empirical understanding um, because the created cognitive capacities that we have aren't capable of grasping him so he's both everything and nothing and this is a kind of paradoxical formulation that you would get a lot in Eckhart and also in Eckhart's uh, in people who are influenced by Eckhart like Tauler Johannes Tauler for example they have similar ideas that have um, this sort of oscillating paradox between God as everything God as nothing God as imminent God as transcendent and this is very typical for the German mystical tradition, I think. Now, would would it be um, would it be all right to call this philosophy from Eckhart to Tauler to Sousa? Would it be all right to call it Teutonic? Teutonic, because it's German, you mean? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess so. So, an interesting question. I, th I think that the, I guess it sort of depends what you think turns on that question. Okay. I mean, they're they're in Germany. They're German, right? Their, their native language is German. They sometimes write in German, which seems significant, as I said before. I think whether or not I'd want to call it uh, like distinctively German in some deep sense maybe turns on the question of whether we can find very similar ideas elsewhere in Europe at the same time. So like, do we find that happening in uh, like France or whatever? And I think um, in a way, the answer is yes. So maybe not maybe not to take an example from France, but think, think about England. So you have like the cloud of unknowing, for example, and you have Julian of Norwich and you have other sort of broadly mystical people who have maybe similar metaphysical ideas as well. So this idea of God as the root of being, God as negatively uh, transcendent, negatively transcendent, meaning that we can't grasp him or say anything about him. Those are pretty pervasive ideas. 
I, I think if I were going to try to put my finger on something that's more distinctive of the German Dominican mystical tradition, it might be that they're not just drawing on this long tradition of uh, negative theology, which I would associate especially with the pseudo Dionysius. They're actually using a lot of like hardcore Neoplatonism. I mean, pseudo Dionysius is a Neoplatonic text, but it's also a Christian text. It's very much about the failure of language and thought to grasp God. But these guys are actually reading Proclus in Latin. So um, you have people like Berthold of Mosburg and Dietrich of Freiburg, and Berthold actually comments on a work by Proclus or a, a version of a work by Proclus. It's kind of a complicated story. But you have like very hardcore Neoplatonic metaphysics going on in German Dominicanism in a way that I don't really see as being reflected in French or English mystics of the period. So I think that might be like kind of the, the Teutonic element. It has to be said, we're only talking about two or three guys there. We're not talking about like a massive movement of hundreds of people reading Proclus, but it is very striking that you have these um, really like pretty, pretty hardcore Neoplatonists working in the middle of the 14th century in Germany. Yeah, it was, it was actually Reiner Sherman that got me into uh, Meister Eckhart. He has his brilliant book on Eckhart and, and Glasenheit, Releasement, right? You have to empty yourself so you can let God, in a sense, move through you, or you need to stay, in a sense, empty. Um, mm -hmm. he, he, he kind of talks like this in some of his, his uh, German sermons. You're doing such a great job taking us through uh, Hildegard and Mechthild and Albert the Great and Eckhart and through all of the stuff. It's great. We're getting a really nice, nice, um, concise and lucid account of this kind of rich tradition. Now, with the little bit of time that we have left, we move to Kuza, Kuzanis, who is, uh, you know, according to Kassir, is the, the true modern philosopher, apparently, yeah. the, the right. true modern humanist in a sense. So who is Kuza and what makes his his thinking in this tradition so important, perhaps. Yeah, I think Kuzanis is, fittingly enough, kind of a paradoxical figure, because on the one hand, you can see him very much as the heir to someone like Eckhart. So he's German, he's a mystic of some kind, and he's very interested in paradox in a way that seems to echo what we were just talking about with the German Dominicans. But on the other hand, he's a humanist, and he goes down to Italy, he's hanging out with the Italian humanists, with the Byzantine emigres, and so on. And so he's really um, one of several figures. So another example would be someone like Petrarch, or, or maybe um, Dante, or uh, yeah, you could maybe think of other figures. I think uh, Christine de Pizan is a really good example. So people who seem like you sort of hold them up and from in one light they look medieval, in another light they look sort of Renaissance, right? which actually should maybe make us a little bit less confident to draw such a firm boundary between medieval and Renaissance, right? But as far as Kuzanis goes, he, on the one hand, is very steeped in this humanist stuff. So he's um, interested in the Greek tradition. Uh, he kind of writes interesting Latin and so on. But on the other hand, his work is very much carrying on these ideas about God's transcendence, God's eminence, and the, sort of the that point I was making about God being everything and nothing at the same time. So very typical for Kuzanis would be the fact that he uses all of these mathematical analogies to express this. So one of the best ones is, um, because it's so simple, is he says, imagine a curved line and imagine that it's like an asymptote so the curve is going like this and getting closer and closer to a straight line right like a like a parabola does right and it doesn't ever touch the line but if you kind of go out to infinity in your mind then you can see that the curved line is basically straight right because it's just hugging the straight line and getting infinitely close to it closer all the time and yet already infinitely close which is already kind of a paradox, right? And then he says the that this line is both curved and straight. So the infinite curve is both curved and straight. 
or another example he gives is that if you had the um like the if you have a triangle right and you make the top angle wider and wider and wider the widest angle is 180 degrees but that's a line and the triangle kind of vanishes at the moment where you reach 180 degrees but as soon as you're getting closer and closer to it you're getting something that's both an angle and a line right so these are supposed to represent what he call famously calls the coincidence of opposites right so you have this idea of two things that seem incompatible like being curved and being straight or being finite and being infinite actually would be another example and he thinks that these phenomena collapse into each other in some sense and an interesting question here is maybe one way to put the question is how weird is this so i think some people think it's really weird like in the sense that he's like denying the principle of non-contradiction or something like that but that's not how i tend to read him so i tend to read him as saying well from our point of view of course either a line is curved or it's straight but if you think about this kind of example you'll see that that's not true you you'll see that when we make the move to thinking about infinity things that seem like they're opposed in the sense of being mutually exclusive are actually compatible and you know you can find a mathematician if you want to know whether this is actually true about asymptotes but the point he's trying to make i think is that in god features that seem to be opposed and antithetical and opposed in the sense that they rule each other out actually turn out to be compatible so they can be reconciled in god and that's um a very kind of abstract way of saying the kinds of things that eckhart had been saying in the 14th century right so this um this idea that god's transcendence allows him to both have all of being within him and yet to not have anything of being in him because if he had anything specific in him then he would be a created object right that that kind of like well is you know is it there or it isn't right are trees in god or not are giraffes in god or not and the answer is well yes and no right and that yes and no thing is something that um kuza really targets right um something else that i think he's picking up from the earlier mystical tradition is this so the thing that he calls learned ignorance dogma dogma ignorantia where the idea is that to understanding god is to somehow strip away limited conceptions and wind up fully embracing your own lack of understanding right but it's a lack of understanding that isn't just like oh i have no idea but it's a it's a learned ignorance because You've gone through this process of stripping away these limited concepts right and again eventually you're supposed to get to this place where you see that these opposites are sort of paradoxically held in tension with each other right and i think here we really see um the roots of what happens in later german philosophy so i mean your listeners or viewers since they're interested in german idealism will probably already have been thinking about hegel right so everything i just said sounds a lot like hegel and I, you know, I don't know, but it seems unlikely to be a complete coincidence that that, that, that is so reminiscent. Actually, a friend of mine is actually working on a thesis on Kuza and Hegel. So, oh, um, wow. Okay. So that's yeah, the first so, thing you should get on to discuss this. Yeah. So actually, there, you don't even need to go as far as Hegel, right? You could even think of um, Luther. So Luther has this yeah. idea of the hidden God, right? And that's very much what we've got in Eckhart and um and Cruzanos. whether luther would appreciate that comparison i don't know but i think he you can sort of see that a lot of these guys are both they, i mean speaking of opposition and sort of yes and no they've got one foot in the scholastic world and another foot outside it they're writing in latin and german or, or they're humanists and scholastics like um like Cruzanos is and Luther is like that too, right? So Luther taught, was was actually both a student and a teacher in scholastic contexts. He knew scholasticism inside out. He hated it, but he knew it. And when he needs to, he can use it, right? So like when he's um, polemicizing against the uh, idea that humans have free will, he will use scholastic terminology and distinctions in order to do that. He even uses the argument from divine foreknowledge to prove that we don't have free will, which is something that 
these scholastics have been arguing about since you know the beginning of the medieval period um or at least since the 13th century so luther is also someone who like these other german thinkers is you know, moving in and out of scholastic philosophy and the, in a way that takes us full circle which is appropriate for Gazanus, because it goes all the way back to the first thing i said which is that university philosophy is not the only kind of philosophy in the medieval period the early modern and the early modern period as well the renaissance period and you really see that very much with the german tradition so the in a way the power of german medieval philosophy i think is that it's such a, such a great example of something that you do see elsewhere as well but a lot of the central figures are figures that are kind of in this ambiguous um situation like they're in convents but they're not part of the power structure like hildegard or they're um writing in vernacular and latin or they're not at the university but they've been trained at the university or whatever it is so you get a lot of these kind of marginal figures which is one reason why a lot of this stuff is so creative i think so i want to thank you for this wonderful lucid you know exciting take through you know taking us back in time and then you know bringing us all the way up to kuza so um, just one last question before, because I know you do have to go. How did you get into medieval philosophy and specifically Islamic and Arabic philosophy? And oh, do you right. have any right. do you have any new things coming out? Of course, I will. I'll put inside the video a, a link to your your podcast is, of course. But do you have any articles, a new book or anything that you're working on? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, to answer the first question first, how I got into it, it was actually kind of Dante. So my, um, it's a kind of a long story, but I was interested in medieval literature and I was interested in philosophy. And then I was taking classes on Dante in, when I was an undergraduate. And I thought, well, this is cool. And this might also be a chance to bring these two things together that I'm interested in medieval literature and philosophy. So that's kind of how I got into medieval literature. Sorry, sorry. That's how I got into medieval philosophy. And then I kind of got into Islamic philosophy because I just thought it'd be cool to learn Arabic and work in an area that a lot of needed seemed to need a lot of attention, um, which was a good idea, I guess. In terms of what I've been doing, well, the so the podcast series is um, sort of moving along through history um, with relentlessness, <laughs> the, the relentlessness of something that comes out once a week. Um, and so in the podcast I'm doing, at the moment I'm doing classical Chinese philosophy with Karen Lai, and I'm doing, I'm finishing off the series on philosophy and the Reformation. So I'm hoping to send that book off to the press, maybe even by, by the end of the summer or by autumn. So that I hope that might come out next year. And also we have two volumes coming out from the Africana series. So those should be out in the next couple of years um, To So I guess those will be, so the two uh, Africana books would be like volume seven and eight in the series. And then the Reformation one would be volume nine. And then it's on to the 17th century. Um, and then there's various other things I'm doing that are on the Islamic side, but that might be the most interesting thing for your uh, listeners slash viewers. Well, thank you for, you know, being our guide and navigating us through this really rich and very, very fascinating history of philosophy and if you haven't listened to the um, Peter's podcast, I will put the link um, in the description. You have to listen to it. It's my favorite, it's my favorite philosophical podcast. Oh, neat. You are dynamic. You're very, very interesting to listen to. I love the Buster Keaton um, inside <laughs> jokes, which are really interesting. And uh, yeah, they're very exciting. And so thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. All right. Take care.